Okay, cool. So today we have polynomial and rational functions. So we're going to learn characteristics about polynomials. We're going to learn characteristics about rational functions. So we first start off with a polynomial function. And we see that a polynomial function of degree n is a function of the form. And you see all this lovely, complicated gibberish. So all this is, is the standard form of a polynomial. So this is the standard form of a polynomial. And this says that your leading term should be a sub n times x to the n. And then the next term would be a sub n minus 1 to the x minus 1 until you get to a sub 2x squared, a sub 1x, and a sub 0. All this is saying is that if you have a polynomial in standard form, it should start with the highest power to the lowest power to the constant. That's it. So all that complicated uh, writing there just says that a standard form polynomial should go from highest power to lowest power to constant, such as if I wrote f of x equaled x to the fourth plus x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one. We go from highest power to lowest powers to constant. That's it. So don't think of it being too complicated. Just highest power to lowest power. OK. Uh, to be a polynomial function, all of your degrees, all of your exponents, all of your powers must be non-negative integers. And what a non-negative integer is, is just a whole number. It is a whole positive number. That's all that means. So non-negative integer means a whole positive number. Just breaking down these fancy terms, right? And then all of your co coefficients, a sub n, and when I say sub n, I mean a subscript n. So a sub n, a sub n minus 1, a sub 2, a sub 1, a sub 0. These are all coefficients that are real numbers. OK, so that is the definition. That is the standard form of polynomial function. OK, now we are going to be looking at the sketches of polynomial functions. And we want to know how a polynomial function behaves. We want to know the end behavior of a polynomial function. We want to know, does it open up? Does it open down? Does it open bottom left to top right? Or does it open top right to bottom left? And we can figure out all that information by using the leading term of our polynomial. So to figure out how a polynomial is going to open, we call it the leading term test. So here we are given the polynomial in standard form again. And all we want to do is analyze this polynomial by its leading term. And its leading term is always going to be the one with the highest power. So in our case, in the standard form, the highest term or the leading term is a sub n times x to the n. And all we need is this leading term to tell us which way the polynomial is going to open on the graph. So the behavior of the graph of f as x approaches infinity or as x approaches negative infinity will be similar to one of the following graphs below. OK, so here we have four cases, two cases where the degree is even and two cases where the degree is odd. So let's look at our first two cases. So up here, I'm going to put the word degree. The degree n is even. This means we have an even degree leading term. So an even degree function, an even degree polynomial would be something such as x squared, x to the fourth, x to the sixth, any even number, right? So these are all even degrees. These are all even powers. OK. So the first case says that we have an even degree, and the leading coefficient is positive. So greater than 0 means positive. So I'm going to put here positive. 
So if I have an even degree polynomial that is positive, such as these examples I wrote on the side, this means that my even degree polynomial function is going to open up. The left side will open up and the right side will open up. I do not connect the tails because our goal is to figure out what happens in between those tails later on. All we're looking at, again, is the end behavior of an even degree positive polynomial function. Okay, so if you're even and your function's positive, your graph will open up, your tails will open up. All right, now down below, we want to analyze the graph. So here is a left side, right side analyzation of the graph. So if we look at the left side of the graph, where are those Y values headed? Up towards where? Toward infinity. Up towards infinity, right? So we're gonna say they're headed towards positive infinity. But this can only happen if X is headed towards where? Negative infinity. Very good. So the left side, Y values get larger, but this can only happen if X values get smaller. Okay. Now look at the right side. Where again are those Y values headed? Positive infinity. Positive infinity. But this time it can only happen if X is headed towards where? Positive infinity. Positive infinity. There you go. So that's what's happening. So as X gets infinitely smaller on the left side, Y gets infinitely larger. So as X heads towards the left, Y heads up towards infinity. On the right side, as X gets infinitely larger, uh, your Y values also head towards infinity, get infinitely larger. Okay, now let's look at case two. So case two is still an even degree function that is now negative, an even degree function that is now negative. I guess I'll use a different color. So I'll say negative. Because you're so less we know than zero. it's an even degree because that's what it's categorized under. Exactly. Under so n is even. Exactly. Okay. So that that component is critical in knowing where you're headed with the with your tail with, with your end behavior. Exactly. Okay, got it. Good. Okay. So now for case two, our degree is even, but now our function is negative. So all we really have to do, but I'll I'll make another section for these functions is take the functions above and just make them what? You just make them negative. So this is what a negative even degree function looks like. And if I have a negative even degree function, this means my tails will open down. Okay. Why are they called tails? Because it's the end behavior and it's the way the, the graph goes. So I call them tails or you can call them end behavior. But it's just, it's showing you which direction the graph is gonna go. Okay. All right. And again, left side, right side, analyze. Now look at your left side. Where are your Y values headed now? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. And this can only happen as X also heads towards where? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. Look at your right side. Where are your Y values headed again? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. But this time, this can only happen if X is headed towards? Positive infinity. Positive infinity. There you go. Okay, so those two cases are done. These two cases only deal with an even degree 
function, one being positive, one being negative. And if we're ever given an even degree function, we know that if it's positive, it opens up. If it's negative, it opens down. Okay. And do not, do not confuse even for being positive. They do not mean the same thing. Even is even, positive is positive. Because here you have positive even, and here you have negative even. So do not confuse those words. Okay. Next, the next two cases deal with an odd degree. So here, I'll write degree again. The degree is odd. And first up, we have an odd degree positive polynomial. Okay, and if my polynomial is odd, it's any odd degree. So that could be x to the first, x to the third, x to the fifth, any odd power. And my function is positive. So if I have an odd degree function that is positive, my tails will open up and to the right, or my end behavior will open up and to the right and down and to the left. And again, we're not filling anything in here. We're not connecting the tails. We're not connecting the end behavior because we're going to learn how to fill in those spaces later on. Okay, so that is the end behavior for a positive odd degree function. And again, analyze left side right side, and on your left side, where are your y values headed? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. And this can only happen if x is headed towards? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. And then on your right side, where are those y values headed? Positive infinity. Positive infinity. And this can only happen if x is also headed towards? Positive infinity. Positive infinity. Okay. Cool. So that's for a positive odd degree. Next. Now, why is, did your arrows go diagonal there versus curved? Versus curved. Very good question. So let's look at our basic odd degree polynomial. How about x to the first power, right? So if I wrote. Let me bring the screen over here. Uh, come on, where's that scroll bar at? Okay, there you are. Okay, so just a quick look. So let's just take a peek at y equals x. So y equals x is the graph of a line. So if I was to graph y equals x, how would it go? Or what numbers could I pick in order to graph it? What happens if x is 0? That means y is also 0. 0. zero. What happens if x is 1? One? One. Y is 1. Y is 1. What happens if x is 2? Y is, y is and two. so on and so on, right? Well, what happens if x is negative 1? Y is negative 1. Y is negative 1. Y is negative 2 y is negative three. So the graph of y equals negative, y equals positive x looks exactly like that. So that's our model for the end behavior of any positive odd degree function. Does that make so sense? All, so all positive um, odds are gonna be y equals x? Not y equals x, as, as long as it's, they will, they will share the same end behavior as y equals x. They'll share the same end behavior because they all have to have an odd degree. So let's say, for example, I put y equals x cubed. Well, this graph, since we know it is a positive odd function, based on the end behavior, we know it will open at the bottom left. 
And I taught you guys, I had mentioned something when we were solving equations. So remember when we were solving like factoring, it was like X squared plus X plus five. And when you factored it, the degree told you what? How many what you should have? Let's just say this what? isn't this isn't factorable, but let's just say factored to like x plus one, x plus four, right? So and I solved and I got x equal negative one and I got x equals negative four. The degree tells you how many answers you should have. It tells you how many times you should cross the x-axis. So here, with that being said, so on this example I just solved above, x squared means you would cross the x-axis twice. So with that being said, x cubed means how many times would I cross the x-axis? Three times. Three times. So let's just say I have an x-intercept here, here, and here. And this is what would happen. So based on the end behavior of our case, we would open down and to the left, and then we would go up, down, up. And this end behavior models this exact case over here. And it also follows the end behavior of y equals x. So you see the comparison there? Yes. They will always open bottom left to top right. OK, no matter what the odd power is. If it was x to the fifth, you would have the same end behavior. If it was x to the What's another odd number? X to the 27th, you would still open bottom left to top right. That would just determine that you've got your 27 marks on the um, X axis. Plots on the X axis. Yeah. So you would cross so 27 times. So what happens times. in the middle doesn't really matter at this point. Exactly. Because okay. we're right now, we're just looking at the end behavior. So hopefully that makes a little more sense. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we'll leave that up because now when we look at case four, case four deals with a negative odd degree function. So a negative odd degree function. And again, all we have to do is take our functions above and just make them negative. Negative x, negative x cubed, negative x to the fifth. Of course, there's more examples. I'm just putting like three odd functions on there. Okay, so now if I have a negative odd function, my tails will now open up into the left, down into the right. And again, analyze left side, right side. Oh, we never got to here. Sorry, we have to finish that part. So, as your y value is headed towards positive infinity, x also headed towards infinity. So that was positive infinity there. Okay, now looking at case four, where are the y values headed here? These are headed up towards where? Positive infinity. Positive infinity, but this can only happen as x goes towards negative infinity. Negative infinity. And then on the right side, where are these y values headed? Down towards negative infinity. Negative infinity. And this can only happen as x heads towards positive infinity. Positive infinity. Okay, cool. So now that's for any <clears throat> negative odd degree function. So here was positive infinity. So all we would do for that example, let's say I did y equals negative x, then my graph would just look like that. We would share the same end behavior as a negative odd function. Okay, so those are your four 
cases for n behavior. So if you are even, if you are even and positive, you open up. I'm not in the camera all the way. So you open up. If you are even but negative, you open down. And then if you are odd and positive, you open up to the right, down to the left. And then if you are odd and negative, you open up to the left, down to the right. So in reality, we're just creating the coolest dance moves you've never seen before, right? Case three and four are all John Travolta. And then case one and two is like touchdown and you drop the ball. So uh -oh. now, now you got it. Now you have a way to remember it. <laughs> All right. There you go. So even up or down, negative, top right, bottom left, top left, bottom right. Okay. Ooh, everybody good with those? And I think so. don't worry, we will be referencing them when we get to the next page. Okay. Here is just all definition. Okay. So now, like I said, I didn't connect the tails. I didn't connect the end behavior because we want to figure out what happens in between them. So this is what it's about. It's called the real zeros of polynomial functions. So this is all definition. This says, if f is a polynomial function and c is a real number, then the following statements are equivalent. c is a zero of function f. c is a solution or root of the equation when f of x equals zero, and c is an x-intercept of the graph of f. The point c comma zero is on the graph of f. Okay, so all this definition is stating is stuff we know already. So guess what? An x-intercept is the same thing as a solution or a root, and it is the same thing as a zero. And the reason this is stuff we know already is because how do you find an x-intercept? You let y equal what number? Zero? Zero. I was like, or maybe we don't know. <laughs> so remember, to find an x-intercept, you let y equal zero. Or if it's in function notation, you let f of x equal zero. And in function notation, it happens to be called a solution or a root. And then when you solve it in function notation, it is also called a zero of the function. And the reason it's called a zero is because to solve for an x-intercept, you must set y equal to zero and solve for x. So this is stating everything we know already, just putting more definition behind it. So a good example I could put, let's say I just said, example, I said f of x equaled x minus three times x plus two. We'll just keep it simple like that. And then I said, find the x-intercept so we let f of x equal zero. So this means you would take x minus three times x plus two equal to zero. You would set both of these equal to zero. And what values would I get for x? If I set x minus three equal to zero, I would get x equals Three. Three. And if I said x plus two equal to zero, I would get x equals? Negative two. Negative two. All right, guys. And now what you just have found are solutions or roots. So in this form, these are now solutions slash roots. These are also in this form called zeros. Because if I decided to plug one of these back in for x, what would 3 minus 3 be? 
Zero. Zero. And it would make the whole function equal what number? Zero. Zero. Right? And the same would go here. If I plugged in negative 2 for x, negative 2 plus 2 would give me 0. And 0 times everything is 0. And then, since we know these are x-intercepts, we put them as 3, comma, 0, negative 2, comma, 0. And this just falls under the definition of everything we know. Look at that. Here, these are the x-intercepts. So they are x-intercepts of the graph. That point C0 is on the graph. They are called solutions or root because they will make the function equal 0 if you plug them in. And since they are, since they make the function equal zero, this is why we call them zeros of the function. So it's everything we know already. We are just adding more labels to it. Okay. Next one. <clears throat> Here, uh, let's call this, let's just say there's A and here's B. So we'll say definition B, and this is what I've mentioned before, a polynomial function of degree n with real coefficients has at most n real zeros. So this is what I was talking about. Whatever the power of your function is, tells you how many zeros, tells you how many solutions, tells you how many x-intercepts you should have. So if my function was x squared, how many zeros should I have? Two. Two. If my function was x to the fifth, how many zeros would I have? Five. Five. And a, a fun one here. If I had x to the 100th, how many zeros would I have? Too many. Too <laughs> many. How's that? <laughs> or 100, right? You get the point? Okay. And a key word here, or two key words, is that the, we see at most. So not all zeros will exist. Sometimes you may get an imaginary zero. So this means that if I had x to the fifth, maybe three are real and two are imaginary but I don't think we'll run into that issue in this class. Since this is business math, uh, we want to avoid imaginary numbers. Okay, but just letting you know the keyword here is at most. Not all of your zeros will exist. Okay, I'll just leave that too many up. That's fun. <laughs> okay, and then C, if f of x is a polynomial of degree n, then the graph of f will have at most n minus one turning points. So basically all this is saying is that whatever the degree of your function is, whatever the power of your function is, if you want to know how many times it's going to turn on the graph, you just take that degree and you subtract one. So let's say I start with x to the fourth. This means that my turning points would be four minus one, and I would have three turning points. And what we mean by turning points is how many times the graph turns or changes directions on the graph. So let's just draw a sketch of x to the fourth. x to the fourth means I cross the x-axis four times, right? So let's just say one, two, three, four. So this is an, and I even wrote a positive even function. So this means if you reference the chart above, it would open up and I would go cross, 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 cross. And here you can see my three turning points. Here's a turning point, one. Here's a turning point, two. There's a turning point, three. It's how many times the graph changes direction. And the easiest way to find it is to take your degree and subtract one. That's it. So let's say I had x to the six. How many turning points would I have? Five. 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 Good. Five turning points. 
All right, one more example. Let's say if it was x to the 10th, how many turning points would I have? Nine. Nine. Cool. And that just tells you how many times the graph changes direction. And just like definition B, definition C also has those words at most. Because again, let's say you ended up with an imaginary x intercept. This means you would have an imaginary turning point, which means they wouldn't exist on the graph. So that's why it says at most. Okay. All right. So again, that covers stuff we know. The x-intercepts, the solutions, the zeros, they all mean the exact same thing. The only thing new we're adding is that a function can tell you, a function's highest power can tell you how many zeros you're going to have and how many turning points you're gonna have. Okay, everybody good to move on? Yes. Okay. All right, now here's where we put everything we just covered to work. So we're gonna look at these graphs. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit. Let's see, there we go. I think that's good. Okay, so we're gonna look at these graphs and answer the questions. So for graph one, it says, what is the minimum degree of a polynomial function that could have the graph? So if we're looking for the degree, this means in order to find that, you want to look at either how many x-intercepts you have or how many turning points you have. So if I look at the x-intercepts, we have one here, one here, one there, one there. I have four x-intercepts, so what would my minimum degree be? Four. Four, right? My minimum degree would be four, which is an even degree. Okay. Now, the next question says, is the leading coefficient of this even degree polynomial positive or negative? So for this one, you would look at your end behavior. So look at your tails. This one opens up into the right. This one's opens up into the left. So if my function opens up, are we a positive even degree or are we a negative even degree? Positive. positive. We are positive. There you go. That's all we have to do for those graphs. Okay. Next. Same thing, what is the minimum degree of this graph? So you look at your x-intercepts, one here, one here, one there. So what would our minimum degree be? Three. Three, which is odd. And now we wanna know, is the function positive or negative? And you look at your end behavior, down and to the left, up and to the right. So this one goes bottom left to top right. Are we a positive odd degree or a negative odd degree? Positive, it's a positive. It is positive. And again, you can reference the first page, right? Right there, it's case three, positive odd degree, bottom left, top right. All right. <laughs> I heard a yes. Somebody got it. All right. Awesome. Okay. Next graph. Look at your intercepts. One, two, three, four, five, six. So what would our minimum degree be? Six. Six, which is even. And now look at your end behavior. Both tails open down. So are we a positive even or negative even degree? Negative. negative. Got it. There you go. Not bad, right? And I did mention you could do it by end behavior as well to find out your degree. Not be, sorry, not end behavior, by um, turning points. So let's just look at that real fast. So this is one turning point, two turning points, three turning points, four turning points, 
five turning points. So remember the formula for turning points is your degree minus one. But here, if you're, so here, if we're finding the turning points, it would be n minus one equal to five. You would add that one over and get n equals six. But it's probably just a lot easier just to count your x-intercepts. What do you think? Yeah, the x-intercepts. I mean, they're both easy, but the X intercept has to be more yeah. accurate. Yeah, because this could become maybe a little confusing, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right, but there you go. You can do it by X intercepts or turning points. All right. Now, still the same thing, but this time we're not given a graph. We are given a polynomial function. So here we still have to think of the degree. We have to think of the functions positive or negative and answer the following questions. So for example two, we have let f of x equal x cubed minus 8x squared plus 9x minus one. A says, what is the maximum number of x-intercepts for the graph of this function? So this wants to know how many x-intercepts should we have? So we look at the highest degree. What's the highest degree on our function? Three. Three. So this means we would have three x-intercepts. Now, B says, what is the maximum number of turning points? So how many turning points would this function have? Two. Two, because it's always the degree minus one. OK. Now, C says, C and D work together. So C says, is the graph increasing or decreasing as X gets infinitely smaller? And D says the same thing. Is X getting, is the graph increasing or decreasing as X gets infinitely larger? So here's where you would reference the end behavior on the first page and figure out what we're working with. So if we look at our function, we have, let me erase this, just looking at the leading term, that is a positive, odd degree, right? So it's positive and odd. So if it's positive and odd, remember that your graph would look like this, up and to the right, down and to the left. So now to answer C, it says, is the graph increasing or decreasing as X gets infinitely smaller? So if X is headed towards negative infinity, where are your y values headed? Negative infinity. Which means they would be increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. Decreasing, good. And then as x gets infinitely larger towards infinity, where are these y values headed? Positive infinity. So would that be increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Increasing. So this would be a case three. So here I'll say positive odd case three. Okay, let's try it again. Example three. Let's go down. There we go. We have negative seven X to the fourth minus two X plus 41. All right, before we begin, we should write down what we have. We have a negative a negative even degree function. Okay, so that'll help us answer C and D when we get there. Okay, so A, how many x-intercepts should this function have? Four. Four, how many turning points? Three. Three. Now, if I am a negative even degree function, what case is that? Two. Case two. And remember, case two looks like that. All right. Now to answer C, it says as X heads towards negative infinity, so as X gets infinitely smaller, are your Y values increasing or decreasing? 
Decreasing. Decreasing. Because as X gets smaller, your Y values get smaller as well. They decrease. Okay. Now, looking at the right side, as X gets infinitely larger, so as, as X heads towards infinity, your Y values again are what? Increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. Decreasing. All right. Cool. Everybody good so far with these two? I have to memorize the cases. <laughs> <laughs> On B, where you got the three, that's because you did the N minus one? Exactly. Okay. All right, let's try it one more time. Oh, Scoot, what was the first one again? We're at. Case what, the, the, the top one? Number, example two? Yes. That was at case three. Case three? Okay. Right. Okay. So was that the answer that it's looking for is case three? Uh, or is well, that just kind of what we're referencing? We're using that to help us. So we're referencing that to help okay. us answer C and D. Got it. Okay. Cool. Okay. So four, we have negative X to the fifth plus five X to the fourth minus 12 X cubed plus X minus 16. And again, we are just looking at the leading term, which has the highest power. So negative X to the fifth, that is a negative odd degree function. Okay. So first up, let's answer A. How many x-intercepts should we have? Five. Five. How many turning points? Four. 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 Good. All right. Now we are negative and odd. What case is that? Laura, where are you? I'm saying four. <laughs> <laughs> case four. And remember, case four opens up to the left, down to the right. Okay, which can help us answer C and D, because here's negative infinity, here's positive infinity. So it says as X gets infinitely smaller, where are your Y values headed? Positive infinity. Positive infinity, which means your Y values are increasing or decreasing? Increasing. Increasing. Good. And then as X gets infinitely larger, so as X heads towards infinity, where are your Y values headed? Decrease. Good. They're headed towards negative infinity, which would be a decrease. Okay. Cool. Everybody good with those? Mm -hmm. All right. Not bad. Not bad. Right. So those are characteristics of a polynomial function. Your exponent, your power, your degree, whatever you want to call it, tells you how many times you'll cross the x axis. And then it'll also tell you how many turning points you have. And then your leading term will tell you which way the graph opens. Will it open up? Will it open down? Will it open top left to bottom right? Top right to bottom left? And then you can get all that information from that leading term. Crazy, right? Okay. All right, I think that's good for polynomials. So now we get into the characteristics of rational functions. So remember, rational is just a fancy word for fraction. So here we're going to have a whole page of definition. So starting it off, it says if n of x and d of x are polynomials, then the function f of x given by f of x equals n of x over d of x is called a rational function. So this is just a polynomial over a polynomial, which is a fraction, but in function notation, or to define it as function, we call it a rational function, which again is a fancy word for fraction. 
this rational function can also be represented as, look at all this crazy stuff, right? But remember, it is the standard form of a polynomial, highest power to lowest power to constant over another standard form polynomial, highest power to lowest power to constant. So let's say I just drew an example of that. I said f of x equaled x squared plus x plus 2 over x squared minus x minus 1. So again, it's just a polynomial over a polynomial. That's it. Highest power to lowest power to constant. OK. The degree of the numerator is known as n, as you see here. And the degree of the denominator will be known as m. So the degree of the numerator is n, and the degree of the denominator is m. And the domain of a rational function consists of all real numbers, except for the ones that make the denominator 0. So remember, if you were finding the domain of a rational function, let's say my function was 1 over x minus 2. Oops. 1 over x minus 2. And I said find the domain. We would set x minus 2 equal to 0, solve for x, and get x equals 2. But what would happen to the denominator if I plugged in 2? It would become what number? Zero. Zero. And can you ever have zero in your denominator? No. No. So what we would say for this function is that you can be any number you want from negative infinity to positive infinity, except for which number? Zero. Mm, not zero. Negative two. Two. Positive two. <laughs> yes. So I could even put it in interval notation, negative infinity to two, union two to infinity. So we would say you can be any number you want except for two. So that's how you find the domain of a rational function. OK. Now, going hand in hand with the domain of a rational function, we come across something called a vertical asymptote. So the vertical line, x equals a, is called a vertical asymptote of the graph. If the graph approaches this vertical line, but never touches this vertical line. So what a vertical line comes from is the domain of a function. So if we look at the example I drew above, we can be any number we want except for 2. So this means if we were to graph this rational function, our graph would get really close to 2, but could it ever touch 2? No. No. No, because if it touched 2, the denominator would become what number? 0. And the universe would explode. So we can't have that, right? So that's what a vertical line, vertical asymptote is. It is a vertical line that your function, your graph, will never touch. So if I were to actually graph this for you, it would look pretty cool, right? So the graph of 1 over x minus 2, I would have a vertical asymptote at x equals 2. So just draw a vertical line, x equals 2. And my graph would look something, let's see, if I pick 3, that would be positive. So one tail would head up towards infinity, and one tail would head down towards negative infinity. And they would get really close, but would never, ever touch, because that is just how it works. That is because the domain of that function, 2 does not exist, or that function does not exist at 2. Therefore, that graph could never exist at 2. So that's what a vertical asymptote is. As you get really close to two, or you get really close to that number, one of your tails will head towards infinity, one of your tails will head towards negative infinity. As you see, 
in this fancy notation over here. So here's a little calculus preview for you guys. So this is called limit notation. It is the one of the foundations of calculus and you'll see it when you get to business cal. So the way you read this, it says the limit as X approaches A of F of X will equal positive infinity or negative infinity. So what do you say the limit as X approaches A? The limit as X approaches A will equal positive or negative infinity. Okay, so if we put that into writing over here, don't worry guys, you have no calculus to do in this class, but I'm just showing you a small preview of it. I could say the limit as X approaches two of f of x will equal positive or negative infinity because we see one tail goes to infinity, one tail goes to negative infinity. Okay. Now, to put vertical asymptotes really, really simple, if you have the domain of your rational function, then you have the equation for your vertical asymptote. So I'm gonna reference the example I did again. If our domain is X cannot equal negative two or X cannot equal two, then my vertical asymptote is the vertical line is the equation X equals two. These go hand in hand. If you have your domain, you have your vertical asymptote. Okay, everybody go with that. Something definitely new to see, for sure. We try to keep things a little bit simple in here, right? If you have your domain, you have your vertical asymptote. Okay. All right. And just like I said, if you want to find your vertical asymptote, you take your denominator. It says it all right here. You take your denominator and set it equal to zero and solve for X, just like we did there. Okay. All right, so those are vertical asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes, we have a little bit of work to do. There's more rules. So a horizontal asymptote happens as X gets infinitely larger, as X gets infinitely smaller, your graph will start to approach a horizontal line and may never touch it. So horizontal lines can actually be crossed because they're not part of the domain. But here we just wanna know that a horizontal asymptote is a line that your function gets really close to, but may never touch. Okay, so there are rules to finding a horizontal asymptote. I guess I could draw a picture for you, hang on. So this is what a example of a horizontal asymptote would look like. So I'll just draw a horizontal line and my graph can get really close to it, but may never touch. Same thing here. There you go. All right. So a couple rules for finding horizontal asymptotes. So not too crazy. Rule one is my favorite. Rule one says that if the degree of your numerator, so remember the degree in the numerator is represented by N and the degree in the denominator is represented by M. So rule one says if the numerator's degree is less than the denominator's degree, then we automatically get a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. That's it. So a good example of that, let's say I had y equaled x over x squared plus one. What is the degree of this x? One. One. And what is the degree of that x? Two. Two. So here, the numerator is smaller than the denominator, 
This means that you would get a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. That's it. Nothing crazy. If it is a proper rational function, then automatically you get a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. Okay. Rule two. Rule two isn't bad either. Rule two says if the numerator's exponent and the denominator's exponent or the numerator's power and the denominator's power are equal, then your horizontal asymptote will be given by the leading coefficients over one another. So a good example of that, let's say I have y equals 2x squared plus 1 over 3x squared minus 1. What are the power of both of these degrees? The numerator's degree is two. The denominator's degree is two. Are they equal? Yes. Yes. This means that under rule two, if your powers are equal, then your horizontal asymptote will be the leading coefficients over one another. So here, my horizontal asymptote would be y equals two thirds. That's it. It's only if your degrees are equal. Okay. And then rule three, not my favorite, but I'm glad we don't do it in this class. If the numerator is bigger than the denominator, then it is no longer a horizontal asymptote. It is now called an oblique asymptote. And the only way to find an oblique asymptote is by doing polynomial long division, which is something we don't do in here, thank goodness, right? So an oblique asymptote looks like y equals mx plus b. It's actually pretty cool. So an oblique asymptote would look something like this. Let's say I have an oblique asymptote and your graph would get close to it like that. But we don't have to worry about it in here. So we're only worried about finding horizontal asymptotes. OK, a uh, good example of that, let's just say I had y equals x cubed plus 1 over x squared minus 1. Here the degree is 3. Here the degree is 2, which means it is no longer a horizontal asymptote. It is an oblique asymptote, and the only way to find it is by using long division. So on your homework, if you come across one of these, I think it says, uh, what is the horizontal asymptote, or is there a horizontal asymptote? And for this one, you would say, no, there is not a horizontal asymptote. Okay, so now, the next examples, we are just going to find vertical asymptotes and we are going to find horizontal asymptotes. Okay. So, number five, it says find the vertical asymptotes of the rational functions. So, for number five, let's go ahead and find the domain first of these functions. So, remember, first thing we want to do is find your domain. You take the denominator, set it equal to zero, and now you solve for x. Okay, so here we can use the square root method. You would add the four over, square root both sides, and x would equal what? Two, but don't forget the x. Whenever you square root something, there's a negative and there's a positive. Never forget the plus or minus two. Okay, so this is the domain. So we know that if we plug in two or negative two, the denominator will become zero. So we know that that can happen. 
So there's our domain. And remember, if you have your domain, you have your vertical asymptotes. So next, I'll just say my vertical asymptotes. Asymptotes will be the equations x equals negative 2 and x equals 2. There it is. OK. And you must type them in like this in my math lab. If you forget the x equals, students do it all the time. They just put negative 2 and 2. It wants, in my math lab, it wants x equals, x equals. That's what you have to type. If you just type in negative 2 and 2, it's going to count it incorrect. So I'm just going to put up here MML input, just like that. Make sure it's x equals x equals. OK, next one, same thing. Just find the vertical asymptotes. So first thing is find your domain. Take your denominator, set it equal to 0, solve for x, move the 18 over. 6x equals negative 18, divide by 6, and x equals negative 3. But we know that can't happen for the domain. And again, if you have your domain, you have your vertical asymptote, which is x equals negative 3. It has to be x equals x equals x equals. Do not forget the x equals. X equals, the, x equals negative 3 is a vertical line. If you just type in negative 3, that's just a number. It does nothing for us. OK. Everybody good with those two? Yes. OK. So that's finding vertical asymptotes. If you have your domain, you have your vertical asymptotes. And so you can have the negative three. So where you said that X does not equal negative three, the answer still remains negative three? Exactly. Because remember that this is just for the domain. Oh, it's just to find it. Okay. It's just to help us find it. But if you want to actually plot the line, we need to write it as X equals negative three. Okay. All right, next is finding horizontal asymptotes. So here's where we use those three rules. So all we have to do here is look at our leading exponents. So look at number seven. What is the highest exponent in the numerator? Three. Three, maybe I'll zoom in one, there we go. The highest exponent in the numerator is three. What's the highest exponent in the denominator? Three. Five. 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 So three and five. So is the numerator smaller than the denominator? Yes. Three is less than five. Is that rule one, rule two, or rule three? One. Rule one which means automatically we get a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. That's it, nothing crazy. Since the numerator is smaller than the denominator, we get a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. And again, for my math lab purposes, you need to write it as y equals zero. If you just put zero, it will count it wrong. So again, MML input. Okay, that's it. That's all we had to do. Number eight, same thing. What is the degree of the numerator? Two. Degree of the denominator? Two. Two. Are they equal? Yes. 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 What rule is that? Two. Rule two. That means that if we use rule two, our horizontal asymptote is the 
leading coefficients over one another. So it's six over two, but that reduces to what? Three. Three. There you go. Your horizontal asymptote is three. Okay. Last one. Number nine. It says, oh, yeah, sorry. What is the highest power of the numerator? Three. Three. What's the power of the denominator? Two. Two. Three is bigger than two. Which rule is that? Three. Three. Do we have a horizontal asymptote anymore? No. No. What type of asymptote do we have? Oblique. We have an oblique asymptote. And the only way to find that is by long division, which we don't do here. So that's it. So our answer would be no horizontal asymptote. Okay. Everybody good with those? Yes. Okay. Cool. All right. So now we will be given the graph of a rational function, and we have to find which function belongs to it. So the first thing it wants us to look at is vertical asymptotes. Maybe I can zoom in a bit. All right. At what x values do you see vertical asymptotes? Negative two and four. Negative two and four. So this would be, this line would be x equals four. This line would be x equals negative two. I should be writing those over here, right? x equals four x equals negative two. All right. Do you see a horizontal asymptote anywhere? Negative two. And negative two. So this would be at y equals negative two, which goes right here. Okay, cool. So now we have to figure out which function that graph belongs to. So one way to think about it is vertical asymptotes come from the denominator. So how could I rewrite these vertical asymptotes in factored form? So now we're just reversing the process. X minus four, X plus two. There you go. X minus four, X plus two. Now let's FOIL it out and see what we get. You'd get X squared and then you would get positive two X minus four X. So you get X squared minus two X minus eight. Okay. So now compare that to the answers below and which answers do we knock out? B and D. B and D are gone. Okay. So we have the denominator. And now we have a horizontal asymptote of y equals negative 2. Who do you think that belongs to? A or C? C. C. We just match them up, right? Negative 2, negative 2. And it's good to go. There you go. Can you tell me again why you reverse those two on the top on the vertical asymptotes? Because we're trying to find the denominator that matches it. So when I say reverse the process, let's look at what we did for vertical asymptotes above. So let me get back on my mouse. There we go. So remember that whenever we find vertical asymptotes, we set the denominator equal to zero and then we solve for x, right? Mm -hmm. So what they gave us is the values for x, and we had to reverse the process. Oh, OK. See what we did? 
So we had to put it back into factored form. I and see. That's, okay. That's all we did there. Because if I was able to, if Which I'm is able the plus to, and minus. Exactly. If I'm able to set these equal to zero, I would get x equals four, x equals negative two. So you're unfoiling. Unfoiling. Very good. Reverse foiling, right? <laughs> there you go. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, everybody good with that? All right. Oh, so much talking. All right. Okay, we come to our, I think our last one. Yeehaw. All right. So 11. A company manufacturing surfboards, X, has fixed cost of 400 per day and total costs are 5,400 per day at a daily output of 20 boards. Assuming that the total cost per day, C of X, is linearly related to the output per day, write an equation for the cost function. Okay, so we have to find a linear equation. So this brings us back to what, 1.2. So remember to create an equation, we need a point and we need a slope. So look at the information it's giving us. It says we have a fixed cost of $400 per day and total cost are 5,400 per day at an output of 20 boards. So they're giving us points here. So our first point is that if we sell zero boards, what is the fixed cost we're gonna pay no matter what? 400. 400, so there's our first point. At zero surfboards, we still pay 400 bucks per day. All right, the next point given, it says total cost are 5,400 per day at an output of 20 boards. So this means if we create, or what is it? Oh, this is cost, right? So if we create 20 boards, we are gonna end up paying 5,400 per day. Okay, so there's the two points it's giving us. And what can I find between two points? Slope. Slope. There's x1, y1, x2 y2 and my slope is going to be y2 which is 5400 minus y1 which is 400 over x2 minus x1 this will give us 5000 over 20 and i think that gives me 250 Yes, so my slope is 250. Okay, uh, maybe I should be labeling these, right? Points, slope, and now let's find the equation using my favorite formula, the point slope formula because it tells us everything we need. We need a point and we need a slope. So we really conveniently labeled one of the points x1, y1. So let's plug that in. I would have y minus 400 equal to the slope we found of 250 times x minus x1, which is zero. You would get y minus 400 equals 250x, add the 400 over, and you would get y equals 250x plus 400. Okay, cool. 
I wonder if I move that. No. I guess we could have found it that way too. Either way. Okay. So here is our equation, but let's put it in the form of a cost equation. So it's going to become C of X equals 250X plus 400. There's our cost equation. Okay. Everybody good with that? Brought back some memories of section one, right? Okay. Next, we get introduced to a new function. We come across the average cost function. So it says the average cost per board for an output of X boards is given by the formula C. So we see this guy here. That is C bar of X has a little bar hat. C bar of X is equal to the cost function over X. Find the average cost function. So all you have to do to find the average cost function is take your cost function, which we just found above, and put it over x. That's it. Take the cost function and put it over x. So c bar of x is going to equal the cost function we just found, 250x plus 400, and you put it all over x. That's it, guys. That's all at once. This is the average cost function. And it'll give us the average cost per board whenever we make X amount of boards. Okay, not bad. All right, the next one wants us to graph the function, include any asymptotes for the domain one through 30. Okay, for one through 30. So I'm gonna put our average cost function back here. So C bar of X equals 250X plus 400 over X. And this wants us to use the X values one through 30. So if we make an X, Y chart, that's the best way to graph this. We'll pick the values one through 30. And let's keep it simple. Let's just say one, 10, 20, 30. And now we get to use our best friend, Desmos, right? So we move that there, bring Desmos here. And I'm going to type it in just like I wrote it, guys. So I'm just going to hit the divide button and do 250. Oh, I should use the keyboard, show you how everything's going, right? So I'll hit the little division button here, creates the fraction, and then 250x plus 400 over x. Okay. Now we want to plug in those numbers. So I hit that little gear icon up there, create the xy chart, and then type in what we got. 1, 10, 20. 30. There we go. And over here, I have 650 to 90 to 70 and 263.33. Okay. So now it wants us to add an asymptote. Well, first off, let's look at a vertical asymptote for this function. Okay, and I'll bring, I can bring Desmos back up in a second. So let's look at a vertical asymptote for this function. So in order to find the vertical asymptote, you have to look at the domain of the function. So the domain means you would take the denominator and just set it equal to zero. Well, that's all we get. We get X equals zero, which can happen. 
which means that you would get a vertical asymptote at x equals zero. All right, but when we have zero, does that fit into this domain? No. No, because what number do we start at? One. One, so we, we cannot plot a vertical asymptote in this situation because it's telling us we must start at one. But it's good that we found the vertical asymptote anyways. Okay, now let's look for a horizontal asymptote. What is the highest power in the numerator? One. One. What's the highest power in the denominator? One. One. Are the degrees equal? Yes. Yes. Then which rule would this be? Two. Rule two, which means you would get y equals what number? Two hundred and fifty. Two hundred and fifty. Because remember, rule two puts the leading coefficients over one another. Well, you get two fifty over one, which is just two fifty. There you go. There's a horizontal asymptote. Y equals two fifty. Okay. All right. Now let's plot everything we have. So we started at one. So there's one, and then I can skip to 10, 20, 30. All right. And then my Y values, 260, 250, 250 260, 270, 290. So we can just go by 200. Why not? I'll just say, I'll skip and I'll say here's 200, 400, 600. 800. Okay. So our first point is at 1 and 650, which is going to be right here. And then our next one's 10 and 290, which I'll put right here, right below, because that's 300, right? And then 20 and 270, just a little bit lower than the last point. And then 30 and 263, just a little bit lower than the other one. So here's what our average cost function looks like on the interval 1 to 30. All right. And now my horizontal asymptote starts at 250. So that's going to be right here, 250. Y equals 250. So if we keep increasing boards, my function's going to get really close to what number? Okay. 250. But will it ever touch it? No. No, right? So here's where I can bring up Desmos again. So watch this. So let me put our asymptote in there, y equals 250. And I need to make my graph accordingly. So we start at 1, and we end at 30. And my y values will say we start at 0. And we go all the way to 650. Look at that. Beautiful. So hiding everything, this is what we just graphed. There's our average cost function. And we see that as we come down, it looks like it gets closer and closer to 250, right? So as we create more boards, we get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to 250. And does it look like it's touching? Yes. Yes, but if I zoom in, guess what? Not touching. <laughs> so to get sure how you entered that um, last equation into Desmos. Yeah, let me see. To actually graph it that way. This one. Yes. 
The Y equals 250? All you did was the Y equals 250 That's and then it. the, um, okay, so we didn't have to do anything with the uh, less than or equal to underneath nope. that? Okay. Nope, not at all. Just Y equals 250. Okay, got it. There you go. And it creates that horizontal line. Yeah. And if I keep going all the way to the right, the same thing happens. It looks like it touches. It looks like they're right there. But if you zoom in, there's still a gap in there. Crazy, right? So it gets really, really close, but we'll never touch. Okay. Which means brings us to the last part. It says, what does the average cost per board tend to as production increases. So this is just talking about the horizontal asymptote. So this means as if X gets larger and larger, so if, remember we are producing more surfboards. So we can say as production increases, the average price per board or the average cost per board, the average cost per board starts to approach what number? 200. Tens to 250. That's it. So if, again, if our production kept going, if we kept making more and more surfboards, we saw that our graph would get closer and closer and closer and closer to 250. So that's what it tends to. So as production increases, the average cost per board gets closer and closer to 250. And that's it, y'all. That's 2.4. Glad we could put an application to all of that at the end, right? <laughs> okay. Um, before you take off, let's look at our schedule. I have it up here. Let me close Desmos. Then let's go to our modules and schedule. So today's the 21st. So this is where we're at. We just did 2.4, which means that again, Wednesday is a review day. So come with questions over homework, come with questions you have over the review. And this means next Monday is exam two. So we're gonna do everything. We're gonna, you're gonna do the test like you did last time. So what I'm gonna do is open the exam for you on Wednesday and you have all week, including the weekend and including Monday to work on your exam. So again, remember that since Monday is an exam day, there will be no class that day. So if I see you guys on review day, great. If you are good, you don't need review then I won't see you again till next Wednesday. Any questions on that? Everybody good? Yes. Okay.